we're going to take a break from the show to feature a new segment that discusses an often overlooked aspect of the business. I'm speaking about creating a family-friendly environment inside the restaurant industry. With help from our friends at Family Forward NC, which is a program of the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation, a nonprofit that works to support children and their families across the state, we're going to discuss ideas, resources, and testimonials from those that work within the company, as well as actual restaurant owners that have implemented family-friendly practices while working with Family Forward NC. And with us on the call is Jim Needell, a restaurant industry HR expert with Performanter. Jim, tell us about your company. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Um, our company, Performanter, serves small, high-growth businesses. And we do a lot of manufacturing and other businesses, but my primary focus within the organization is hospitality. And what we do is we look at the future of work and try to help small businesses implement certain activities that are going to help them get to the next level through scale and through technology. And you're particularly working with restaurants, hotels, hotels, bars. That's correct. How has COVID-19 in this past year impacted and changed the food and beverage industry from your perspective? The perspective that I look at it is that our industry has never seen so many businesses close and the unemployment levels that we're experiencing are, are just unbelievable. Hundreds of thousands of restaurants and millions of hospitality workers are out of work. As this hospitality flywheel begins to turn again, we'll realize that we are long overdue to improve how we are treating our employees. Our employees were left to fend for themselves during the pandemic, unfortunately. Many will not be coming back. They've left the industry to pursue a different career, and many have also opted to take an early retirement. I think employees in our industry are going to need to create what we call a performance or a trust strategy. I have a friend that had just recently been let go mm -hmm. from his job in the restaurant business. He was a general manager of a somewhat prominent restaurant in Raleigh with a prominent restaurant group. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic first hit, they cut his benefits. And then they cut him because he was the highest paid employee. Mm -hmm. And so they said, your salary's got to go. And I just thought, wow. It's so short-sighted of the restaurant, one, to cut their benefits and not figure something out. There's PPE money out there. There's people like you who could figure out how can we figure this out to maintain our employees' benefits while still keeping the lights on and paying our employees. But also, how about having a conversation with the employee and say, hey, would you be open to taking a salary reduction right now or something rather than just, no, yeah. your salary's too high, so you're gone. Like That's just such a lack of value in, of employees and it shows why they probably have high turnover. Yes. You know, I, I hope that employee and, and that GM doesn't take it personally because it's not. And everybody that's been in a similar situation shouldn't take it personally. Unfortunately, the business, the industry, hospitality is very much as good as your last meal. You know, it's yeah. short, it's low margins and we've always struggled with that area. But we've also never taken a look at the people practices from a 40,000 put view and then narrowed in and see what can be done. There's benefits that weren't available 10 years ago or five years ago even. And especially with COVID and the pandemic and everybody now becoming more comfortable with virtual connections and communications, we can implement telemed for employees and direct primary care resources for employees that are very affordable. So what would you say to the company who let my friend go when the pandemic hit? That's a great question. I, I hope they would call us at Performanter and take a look at the Family Forward North Carolina website. There's a, a slew of resources we can get involved with a very short amount of time. As a matter of fact, Family Forward North Carolina will offer three free hours of, of advisement. We call it HR advisement instead of consulting because consulting tends to be a bad word out there in the hospitality business. But within those three hours, we can really help implement or map a plan out that's going to lead the way forward. And we can get some things implemented in those short three hours. We've done that, and that often leads to additional work with that employer, but it's the very much value added. And everybody that we can talk to, I can provide um, clients that we've talked to in the past that would say it's the best thing they've ever done, and why didn't they do it sooner? Yeah, if you want to find out more information, you go to familyforwardnc.com and look for the Return to Work page for more information dealing with this topic. Family Forward NC is an innovative initiative of the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. Family Forward NC can provide your company with resources and support to help you implement practices like paid leave, flexible work and scheduling, health benefits and flexible spending accounts, child care support, and more. For more information, please visit familyforwardnc.com. Business smart, family friendly, future ready. You are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. 
The NCF&B takes the listener behind the scenes to tell the stories of the people that contribute to the creation of the food and beverage community of North Carolina. And now, the misfits in the dish pit, the faces of the front. They are Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss, and we are all a buzz today as we go out to Charlotte to speak with Cloyster Honey. And with us to talk about that and everything and how it be is the founders, Joanne De La Rionda and Randall York. Welcome, Joanne and Randall. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. And you're coming to us from the uh, the Queen City down there in Charlotte. So uh, we're on Zoom, um, keeping our, our safe distances. Though, uh, hey, Matt. Uh, I have received my first vaccination. Kudos to you, my Thank friend. Thank you. Thank you. Please, everybody in phase three, if you are a frontline worker in some capacity, you can get one. Mm-hmm. And actually, I asked Matt because he asked if I got it. And I said, no, I can't get I'm trying to get an appointment, but I can't get one. And so he sent me a link. So hopefully I can figure this out on my own. But uh, yeah, if you're, if you want them, they're out there, I guess yeah. I'm mm-hmm. trying. So yeah, once I get one, then I'll say, yeah, everybody should. Get one. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I just got vaccinated since this recording. So yay me, woohoo, go get vaccinated. So that's a, that's a good connection. Then the next time we do this podcast, uh, we'll do it not just in the same room, but we'll be sitting on each other's laps. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be better. But welcome. So I am really excited for this cut to all the bee puns. It's a buzz. Uh, This is going to be a sweet as honey episode. All of that. Um, Just thinking about honey as a as a as a big topic that's a big topic of course there's been countless documentaries talking about the loss of our honeybees and what it means to the economy and what it means to be a humanitarian are we doing things right there's so many great questions to ask but i think just to let's get let's squeeze it all down just to north carolina let's squeeze it even further down to you two and down to the business as it stands from right there cloister honey in my opinion, it's probably the most recognized honey producer in North Carolina. If anyone else is higher, they're like, hey, what about us? But I don't know who you are right now, so I'm sorry. I've always enjoyed myself some cloister honey. So maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about how your business got off the ground, how it got started. We'll go from there. Yeah, she, uh, Joanne bought me a Christmas present, bought me a beehive for Christmas in 2006. Didn't want it, didn't need it, wasn't that interested in it. Um, but I've always been kind of nerdy, never really been too afraid of things. Like jumped out of planes in the army, not afraid of pain and new experiences. So started doing keeping bees. And we started with one hive and then um the Mecklenburg County Beekeepers Association is a they've got a great training program that starts uh, early in the year each year. And as do a lot of the larger places, the Raleigh's, the Winston's do. I had the one hive about six weeks into it, realized I had some equipment that wasn't perfect with some of the bees that we were going to get. So we had to buy another hive immediately. So before we started, we had two. By the end of the year, we had about 10 hives because we kept catching swarms and <laughs> it, was, it kind of kind of took to it and it kind of grew quickly. But uh, um, the end of the next year, probably had 20 hives and we were doing it all in our backyard as a hobby, just for fun, very quickly. Joanne walked out on the back porch one day to show bees to someone and got stung on her lip and realized she was allergic to bees. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. You got stung yeah, Matt, by your own design. Oh, yes. I was just going to say, yeah. Matt, like, as a wife, would Sarah ever just kind of go, hey, Matt needs a hobby. Here's some bees. Here, here's a hive. Uh, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. <laughs> why? I mean, Joanne, where did this idea, why did you think this is something that Randall would want to get into? I was so naive. I think you're naive about a lot of things in life. (laughs) And being a beekeeper was definitely one of them. A friend of ours, her son had done like his senior project and they had a hive. And I think Randall showed a little bit of interest. And I wanted to get him something because we owned uh, another small business at that time. We owned a, well, he owned a household moving company. And he was really, really busy with it and really wasn't (laughs) spending enough time outside 
um, you know, it's kind of stressful. That job was very, very stressful. And that was already <laughs> a side job from because you guys were both in finance, right? That's right. Yeah, we were working for the bank at, for um, Wachovia at the time. And uh, yeah, and so I thought, here's how naive I was. I thought, oh, if I get him a hive, the bees will come to that hive and they'll just kind of do their thing. So I thought of a hive more as something that was was managed on its own outside from us, except for the byproduct of honey. A hundred percent wrong. hundred percent. It's not, if you build it, they will come. You have to actually get bees and put them in the hive yourself. So you have to really start the hive. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, you have to manage the hive. So people are like, Oh, I want to get bees. It's not like uh, having a turtle. That maybe once in a while you just kind of throw some food into, you know, it's more like having a dog or a cat. You really have to pay attention to it. You have to know it. You have to see how healthy is it, what's going on with it. So, yeah, it was kind of, I kind of stepped into something I wasn't expecting, but he was really, really good at it. Uh, he just really, Randall took to it. You know, he loved it. As a, then, as a recent new proud owner of a puppy, uh, two weeks old, I understand what that now means. Like, oh, God, round the clock, attention for the dog. Uh, it's a little much. I can only imagine how many bees. Uh, I assume each bee is probably not a pain in the butt, but maybe just like, you know, a few thousand. The might queen be. bee. Uh, how many bees are in, like, say, that first hive? When you Going back to the beginning, when you did that, how many bees would populate a hive? So in the summer, you have somewhere around 60,000 bees in a hive. Holy cow. Um, it decreases. So the life cycle. So here's the other thing is, you know, knowing absolutely nothing about bees, keeping bees, understanding them, um, understanding how they produce honey, why they produce honey, learning about it. And anyone that's interested in beekeeping, go to your county extension office Almost every county, every January or so, will do some level of beekeeping 101 because you want to learn about bees before you actually start to keep bees. And the time to keep bees is around March. That's when you can purchase, um, you know, different levels of bees to start a hive. So in Which January, makes a lot of sense, especially here, like March is when spring yeah, is springing yeah, and when, that's when you plant yeah. your vegetables and stuff like that. So. Exactly right. Like the maple trees start to bloom in February or so. So, and this is where it gets into sort of this humanitarianism. And I see where vegans come from when it comes to honey. Mm. But when you take classes and you learn about bees, you read books, you know, ABCs of beekeeping or backyard beekeeper, you learn a lot about them. And one thing about honeybees, so there are so many types of bees, right? You've got bumblebees, you've got carpenter bees, you've got so yellow jackets. A hornet isn't a bee, but it's in sort of the same family. Everybody kind of lumps them together. Honeybees in particular are not native to the United States. Mm -hmm. They came with the settlers. Really kind of cool that the settlers brought them from England because they had them there. They were known as stinging flies mm. to the Native Americans, and Native Americans were able to keep track of the settlers coming across the United States because they didn't have these stinging flies, and suddenly these stinging flies would appear. And since bees can travel, honeybees travel anywhere up to about 10 miles or so, you know, seven, five to seven to eight miles they kind of figured out what was happening and they can kind of see this progression. So honeybees are not native to the United States. And in the 90s, our honeybee population was almost decimated with mites and parasites and things that came from Europe, yeah. especially from Asia. So they would come on container ships. I, I've read all about that. It's almost like phylloxera damaging the wine vines, mm -hmm. but in the reverse, because those mites are still uh, adversely affecting bees. Yes. So, uh, you know, so they were able to live feralily. They were definitely managed by beekeepers. And we'll talk about management a little bit because management of hives is really where we get our pollination from. Mm -hmm. But the bees, um, so there were hobbyists that could keep bees. That was cool. Bees lived out in the woods. Bees lived feralily on their own. They were able to survive because uh, bees are very, very efficient 
in their maintenance. They really take care of themselves. They take care of the queen. They take care of the hive. It almost decimated the population. So, Because what what do they do? They they literally they, eat them or they eat their hives and then they have no habitat? Or how do, how do they decimate the well, population? Well, they need Randall to give the... And, okay. And, and, yeah. You know, he had to step away for a quick second. I think they actually eat their flesh. They're like, the mites land on the back of the bees and... I saw some video, but it's like they, they're like, oh, see here, the queen bee has a mite on her back, and that's pretty much the end of the colony now mm. because of it. So, yeah, yeah that's yeah, crazy. They destroy the actual bee, mm-hmm. not, hey, honey, we're talking about the mites coming over in like the 90s and decimating. Mm-hmm. So at that point, because of it, you needed to be able to manage a hive. You needed people, humans, who could manage their hives, meaning watch them, make sure that they stay healthy, get rid of those mites in a you know, in a natural way, which there are different natural remedies for them, and make the hives healthy so the hives could populate and propagate in order to build up the bee population. So we had that in the 90s, and then we got hit with um, colony collapse disease, disease, disorder. Disorder, disease. yeah. And what, what is the colony collapse disorder? What happens there? So what happens that is the... Essentially, you end up with weak queens, and the health, the overall health of the hive just starts going down quickly. And where in the summer you need, you know, sixty thousand bees, so to be making a lot of honey, the you know you got a weak queen, you end up with only forty thousand bees. Well, it takes thirty thousand bees just to keep the, the the hive going, keep it strong, keep it because it takes a lot of energy for the queen to lay all those eggs, to raise all those babies, mm-hmm. to feed all those, and then make excess honey. Because mm-hmm. that's what we're taking from. We're still in their excess honey. Right. That's why we harvest in you know early summer, and that gives them the rest of the summer and early fall to get their stores all built back up because they're hoarders. They'll, they're, they'll keep making food as long as there's space in their hive. I see. And we need to leave them with 40, 50 pounds of honey inside the hive to get through the winter. Okay. And if they go if they go into October with thirty pounds of honey stores, they're not going to make it. They're going to starve to death in February. I see. I, so when you talk about splitting the hives, or you talked about swarms, does the queen bee just propagate and so populate the hive, or is there other colonies that they merge with? Like when you grow, no, your they hives? never merge. A weak hive can be uh, attacked. Taken over. It can be taken over by another hive okay. they come in they kill the queen they kill the babies they steal the food just but they don't medieval take the wor- war they don't take the workers like the workers don't go work no. for that queen okay <laughs> some of the workers may go so this is so you got two things going on workers from another hive that's called drifting so if you have 10 hives in one yard and they're really close together that's how i ended up in north carolina it's like the same thing <laughs> i like went for a new, <laughs> new place yep exactly but your you queen was strong um, yeah, my queen's yeah, very yeah. strong. Yeah, she was the one that led the charge. Yeah, she is. <laughs> <laughs> if if a if a worker comes to the door, because everything's controlled by pheromones, smell. So if a worker comes to the door of a hive that is not its home hive, and it's bearing water or pollen or nectar, the guards at that door will will smell it, and they're like, "Oh, you're a stranger, but hey, you're bringing food. Come on in. Come on in. You're good. You're come on in." But if they come in, they try to come in empty-handed. They'll they'll push them away. They'll fight them. Mm-hmm. They'll, 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 what, they'll kill them. What they'll Randall's them. saying is BYOB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wait, BYOB. Um, bring your own pollen. Yeah. <laughs> bring, yeah bring, okay. BYOB. Bring your own pollen. That's this, right. This is fascinating. I mean, I know the culture of bees was fascinating, but then to hear from people who intimately know and have raised their own hives is just it's it's awesome. So, what do they? Is there? a uh, knowledge of who you are or does it matter as long as the beekeeper is doing the right job or whatever that means, bringing them food or helping manage as you use the term. Is there any exchange of, or knowledge or recognition is the word I guess I'm looking for. Bees in, in the, in a perfect world, bees are living about 42 days. Okay. That's it. So So we don't have a long relationship. 42 days. (laughs) It's enough to get through the desert, though. 42 days. Not quite. It's not a one night stand, but it is. It's pretty short. Okay. (laughs) For the queen, it is. But other than that, it's not. Yeah. Um, For the, so for the, do y'all know much about the life cycle of the bees? Well, that was going to say, so queens actually live fairly long, though, right? For the life cycle of the queen, 
the the queen is the only female that lays eggs in the hive. Right. Okay. So one queen lays every egg that there is. All of the eggs, or about ninety seven percent of the eggs that she lays, are female. The females are the workers. And she can dictate if she wants a male to be born too, which is like you're correct. Baller. Hmm. A, a queen oh. can choose to not release the uh, enzyme or whatever it is that would then make it a female, she can say, ah, we'll squirt out a couple of non-pheromone eggs, and those will be the drones, right? Non, um... I don't have the proper terms, but... Uh, yeah, sorry, okay, so an egg that is not inseminated. So the queen lays about 97% are females, and they're the workers, and th- about 3% are the boys, and the boys... Only job in life, mm-hmm. their only job is to mate. Hell yeah, up and top. To make- <laughs> oh, yeah, in- in- enjoy that for a minute. Yeah. And enjoy, to make that. Food. enjoy that for a very short period right. of What's time. That? <laughs> and Joanne would say, put a pin in that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, here's the um, kicker. Here it comes. Here's the kicker. That's so right. Now, back, back to the feet, back to the, the queen. She's laying 97% female eggs, mm-hmm. okay? They're all the workers. As each egg hatches within the first 72 hours. The worker bees, the nurse bees that are taking care of that uh, larva and feeding it, they come out, they smell the pheromones, and they decide, is our queen healthy? Is she strong? And is she going to make it? If all those answers are yes, then they go from feeding that larva um, bee bread, which is like pollen nectar. I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, Royal jelly. Right. So royal every jelly. Every larva when it's first born is for fed something called royal jelly. Royal for the first jelly. three days. Good name for a band. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so, at about the seventy second hour, the the nurse bees decide is is the queen strong? Is the hive strong? Do we need another queen? Because if they continue to feed that larva royal jelly, that larva will develop into a queen. Oh. But for ninety seven percent of them. The answer is no. And they're like, we just need more workers. So then they go to bee bread, which is pollen, nectar, and water, and or pollen, nectar, and honey. And then it converts over to worker bee, which lives 42 days. Now back to the bee that they continue to feed royal jelly. That and bee develops sorry, into a queen, a virginal queen. So after 16 days, she hatches. And just say that, you know, the hive just lost their queen that they've had for four or five years. So, so that, that, that's the answer to the question before. A, a, a queen bee can live from four, for four to five years. Wow. Sometimes six or seven or eight. Yeah. But typically the sweet spot is in the one, two, and threes when they make the most babies and the hive is the most productive. Sure. And you got to try to you know, keep them from swarming. Yeah. You know? I mean, well, it's not <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, but yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe after the last night's episode, we'll see. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Meghan Markle taking down the royal jelly. <laughs> yeah, she's not eating that jelly. No, she, she is was not, not eating the jelly. royal jelly. <laughs> yeah, she's making her making her own hive. <laughs> That's but right. Yeah, when this virgin queen hatches and she she emerges, she comes out and for a couple of days she makes what's called orientation flights. So she'll fly probably within a couple hundred yards of the hive just for the first couple of days. Now she's not, she's not, um, she's still a virgin. So she's not ready to be a true queen yet on, you know, the fifth to 10th day or so she will take what's called a mating flight and the queen will fly. So a typical hive, the, the drones will stay relatively close to their hive. So when this queen, which is their half sister, this new queen, emerges, she makes sure she flies um, a couple miles away. So she flies further than her half brothers can fly. That way, when she goes into this thing called a DCA or a drone congregation area, which is where a lot of drones congregate. This sounds like my wife's trip to Europe back before she met me. (laughs) (laughs) Just like the hostel was the drone congregation area. (laughs) Randall and I used to call it the epicenter. The epicenter. It's yeah. in this place called the epicenter. It's called a frat house. Raleigh, that's sure. what that's called. Yeah. 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 Right. Yes. And so what you have there is you'll have hundreds of drones, and they're just circulating. And the drones have big eyes, big noses, strong wings, and they're very good flyers. Okay? The queen, she comes into this bar, this drone congregation area that forms you know, in nature, 
And she comes through with little wings, bad eyes, slow flying, and she's got she's putting off a pheromone that drives the boys crazy. So the boys, the drones, compete to, to fly up and mate with her. They fly up, get positioned behind her, and mate with her in midair. Wow. And about, I mean, and about three seconds into it, they literally and figuratively explode and hit the ground dead. Oh. The, now it's I a way to go. I mean, I mean yeah. It's, it's kind of like the pinnacle of manlyhood, right? Being yeah. able to make love and procreate in midair. Because the drone's life is how long? How long did you say? How many days did they live? Oh, they can go about 40 days. They're short term. Yeah, but a worker bee's 40 days as well. So you're yeah, like, yeah, I could yeah. spend my whole life working for the machine. Or, or hanging out at the sit drone around and then congregation area. Yeah. I, I kinda, <laughs> yeah, I'm back to the drone life. Drones can live longer. Oh, drones can live longer than worker bees, can't they? I don't think so. Oh, they live about the same. I'm not, 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 I'm not positive. Remind me, how do you be get chosen to be a drone versus a worker bee if you're a male, or is it is it if you're she a male? to do it? She just she only she does three percent male drone population to the ninety seven percent worker bee. If you're born male, you're automatically a drone. You're not a worker. That's correct. Okay, yeah. a male. You a are male genetically a drone. a drone. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Okay. And exactly. So, so the first the first drone mates with her, and then. Literally explodes, hits the ground dead. The next one flies up, gets in position behind the queen, inserts. Three seconds later, he literally and figuratively explodes and dies. Sounds about right. Hits the ground dead. And this is repeated, you know, six to 12 to 15 times in one mating session. Whoa. <laughs> wow. I'm not even going to make these jokes. I mean, I can't. This is a family <laughs> show, but good I mean, on you, queen. All right. I don't think you the can even watch that stuff on Pornhub. The, <laughs> <laughs> the queen then returns to the hive, and in an ideal situation, she never leaves the hive again, ever. Yeah, she can't walk. So when she, <laughs> right. She can fly. <laughs> yeah. When she starts laying eggs, she will start laying, she'll lay like 500 from the first drone, the first dad, then 500 from the second one, and then 500 from the third, and she can rotate through her supply. Oh, wow. The reason she does that is some drones are better guards. Some have genes that are better cleaners. Some are better honey producers. And some are inert. So some are just not, some are duds. And if she picks the wrong one and it's all duds, that hive will die very, very quickly. So Ooh. wait, she holds on to that fertilization for her lifespan? So basically she had one night in Paris. And then after <laughs> that, she. She can just pick and choose. She's like, oh, we need a couple more uh, mats. And then oh, that's enough mats. Uh, a couple maxes now. And then so on. It was a weird parallel that I made there. But yeah, uh, a couple oh, yeah. of these guys you now, a couple of those guys. Now, a couple of, oh, because she holds on to the she supply. She holds on to the supply of fertilized so eggs. She mates, so a queen mates once in her life. Well, not one, one, one mating yeah. session. Yeah. And then. So th this is fascinating. I do like when you say you get the virginal queen and you don't have, she yet has a population. You then bring on some worker bees. They're kind of like uh, free agents that, that you just kind of like brought in to kind of give her a fleet, give her a team, right? And a start. Then, a start. And then that starts to kind of propagate. And then they're there to kind of be her boosters as well. Be like, yeah, let's support this queen. And then, then foster more, uh, more bees as time goes on. But how do you know what. Okay, so once she's mated, does that virginal or she's no longer a virgin? Does she go to her own hive physically? Starts a different hive. Well, typically she'll go back to the hive that she was in. She's a lot. Most of the time, she's replacing the queen. Okay, but this is when a swarm occurs. So if they've got a decently strong queen, and then that queen produces, say, three or four other queens, those will come back and either if they go out and mate and come back, then they will. Come and they'll gather some of the, you know, twenty percent of the hive, and then they will leave the hive and go somewhere else and start another one. That's a swarm. Okay. So a queen can either be just supplanted or replaced because she's weak, or if it's a strong hive, she may say, "This is how we propagate the species," and she makes new queens and then right take then twenty percent and get out of here. Good good luck yeah. to you. But if and so if the queen is weak or uh, past their prime or something like that, then that queen will become the queen of that hive the, when, when that, they come out? Yes. Yeah. 
And the way they handle it is they'll quit feeding. Once the new queen comes in and starts laying and her pheromones are strong, they're all pheromone driven. They will quit laying. They'll quit feeding the old queen and then she'll die. Okay. Wow. Wow. Nature is brutally efficient. Seriously. And, and what, uh, the, the the virginal queen that you buy that you can propagate how you start your own hive how did how do wh- whoever acquires this this queen know that it is a queen well they, they're different sizes so I your see. worker bees are like one knuckle mm-hmm. your queen is like two full knuckles and your drone looks like the like so okay. drones kind of oh. rounded Wait, and fat and slow so people are that talented or that acutely aware because you're picking this out of 30 to 60,000 oh. bees you're talking to one right now. Like he probably like knows you this. could see this. Yeah, you, once That's you see crazy. it, queens are. Uh, there's a, an industry out there that produces queens. Okay. So a lot of universities, University of Georgia, has some incredible biologists that study and or Jennifer Berry, yep. mm-hmm. like Jennifer Berry, um, but they're all over. So people will their job is to actually produce queens, and they sell queens mm. for about. $30, yeah, $30 a bug. A bug. That's crazy. Amazing. That reminds me, I just saw Coming to America yesterday, part two. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. So they went to Queens for me. to find a queen, remember? <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's switch gears and do a little bit more about your process and what you're doing. Actually, let's take a quick break to yes. talk about uh, someone who helps uh, help our hive here at the, uh, at the kitchen studios. And we're talking about Triangle Wine Company, which is a fantastic wine shop where you could get, I bet they might sell mead, which is a, a honey-based sure alcoholic beverage, as well as fantastic wines, beers, spirits, uh, bitters, whatever you need, as well as an opportunity to sit down with your fellow worker bees sip on a pint, a glass of wine while you're in the place, or you can get delivery to take back to the hive. You can get uh, curbside because, you know, curbside, a lot of times bees just go out, hang out on the corner, and then they receive their whatever. For the drone activation center, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so uh, so go to trianglewineco.com, and when you're buying something online, you can use the NCFB promo code to get a fantastic discount as well. Yeah, and I also want to say congratulations to them because, you know, I kind of feel like our businesses are symbiotic, and as their business grows, our business grows, and yeah. they just opened up their new location. So if you've been in Wake Forest or you know, the outskirts of North Raleigh and listening to the show and be like, damn, I just can't get to the Triangle Wine Company. Well, now you can because they, they are in the Bedford area. a new hive yeah. up in the Northern Raleigh area. Yeah, so they let their queens uh, propagate. Make, That's right. Make more. Yeah, see how we're learning they about life. They took 20% of their workers and went to North Raleigh. I, I'm, I mean, I'm being real here. I, knowing that I was going to speak with you guys, uh, I started going down this crazy wormhole of, uh, of like bee videos and wanting to learn more about it. And it is unbelievably fascinating. What I also found to be fascinating too, is that everybody knows their own job kind of like right when the, when the, from birth. And, but what I also like is that their jobs actually change and they like rotate it and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, from what I understood is that from the larvae or pupa stage, once they're like birthed or so, and they come out of the little comb, right? They they come out of the little cell. Their first job is to clean their place, I think. And then they're like, now you clean the area and then you protect like the front gates a little bit. And then you kind of grow into like more responsible jobs. And then the final job, I guess, is to go out of the of the hive and go um, pollinate, right? To go to get pollen and bring it back in. And that's kind of like that's the big baller gig. If if once you're a bee, that's the the choice job, from what I gather. Also, the probably the most dangerous too. Yeah. Well, so what happens is they're worth more to the hive when they are young. So they come out, they clean their hive, they become nurse bees. So the nurse bees feed the larva, and then once they age out of that, after the first seven or eight or ten days, then they take another job in the hive. They may be receiving water and nectar and pollen from other from the uh, forager bees, the older bees. And then some of them become guards. And then, you know, that's the three weeks. And then in the the last three weeks, they're foragers. So they go out and they fly a mile from the hive and they find the pollen nectar. And they may get caught in a rainstorm. They may get eaten by a bug. So you'd much rather have someone that is five, six weeks old get eaten by a bug than someone that is four days old get eaten by a bug. It's better for the energy of the hive and the sustainability. It's it's just amazing. You're right how how efficient nature is, and that they have this all figured out. And for all for our knowledge, they don't have a a spoken language, but uh, well, they man, definitely do they communicate. communicate. It's those pheromones they're communicating yeah. with. Um, so 
okay, let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, for one, we talked about bees do end up making a surplus of honey, and that's how Cloyster Honey or any honey company can can exist without just completely decimating all the reserves of a beehive. So from what I gather, though, you're saying you're taking um, a, a good set amount of what they're producing, but enough for them to to get high on their own supply, so to speak. Um, but they make so much that like, they'll just continually make once you pull the reserves out. Right. And they'll just fill up that space again. Is, is that how it works? You can just kind of keep pulling from their hive. Yeah. So what they'll do is they will keep the, around the, where the nursery is, where all the bees are, they've got storage around those in those two boxes. So a lot of people see beehives to see the two big boxes. Hmm. So they've got stores all in those, and there's usually 60, 70, and my weigh 80 or 90 pounds a hive, my weight may weigh about 90 pounds. Wow. Then we put these things called honey supers. That's the thinner boxes that you see. That's where they put their excess honey. And typically they will always keep honey around the net, the nursery, and the extra stuff goes further away. So we steal the stuff that's further away on the top. It's like an offering then, to the gods in a way, <laughs> and you are their almost. god. <laughs> and then in like in um, you know July, whenever we do our final harvest, then they're condensed back into those two boxes, and they have a couple months to build their stores back up. Okay, so now let's get into the tastes and the flavors of honey. So I'm now hearing all this, and you know Max and I, we often relate things to wine because that's what we know. But just like a vine gives you different flavors and uh, nuances of fruit. I'm guessing that each hive gives you different flavors within the honey. Is that accurate? And what are some of those factors, if so, that, that change the, the flavors? Uh, it's in a way it's kind of accurate, but uh, if you have multiple hives on a property, you're going to see a little bit of a difference mm -hmm. maybe in the flavor, but you'll definitely see it or feel it or taste it um, within hot between hives in different locations. Sure. So, you know, so what a bee does, like I said earlier, you know, it's going to fly, it's going to find, it's going to be really efficient and it's going to fly to its closest food source. Mm -hmm. So whether that needs water or pollen or nectar, you know, that's where it's going to go, but it could go, you know, five to eight miles and try to get something. So think about even within the city of, we'll use Charlotte as an example, you can think about Raleigh, is when you think about the bee flying, how big an area five miles in a concentric circle is, right? If I fly five miles from center city, Charlotte, I'm, you know, I can be close to Matthews, yet at the same time, I can be in the university area, I can be close to Belmont. I mean, that's a pretty wide range. Most of the trees and plants that we have here in a city are roughly the same, but you might have a lot of uh, bramble in a certain place. You know, bees can get to blackberry bushes, they can get to trees. So every year, the honey is going to taste a little different. It's going to be a different color based upon mm. um, what bloomed, how quickly it bloomed, how much water there was, how much rain we had that year. Rain can slow down or speed up, you know, um, the production or the popping of flowers. Uh, it could get rid of pollen really quickly. And so, yeah, you're right. So it tastes different year to year. With that irregular flavor profile, do you ever do anything post in the lab to make it consistent? Is that something or is that something I shouldn't ask someone? Uh, uh, no, you, you, can, ask that. you can ask. I'd say what we do is Joanne is very, very, very discerning. She'll turn away a lot of honey. So we raise, hun we raise honeybees. And we raise some honey, and then we purchase honey from beekeepers in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and a little bit from Florida. And she's very discerning. We always get samples of anything we're buying because we buy – we no longer buy pails. Now we're buying barrels and, and larger. Yeah. So she's always tasting it before we ever receive – before we ever agree to purchase anything. And yeah. then and is there a blending process then? or I, we, we do not blend. Okay. So – Blending to me is what large commercial honey producers do. So what they, you know, everybody, uh, you know, everyone talks about the honey and the bear, but we all have sort of this understanding, this um, past history flavor profile stuck in our brains about what honey tastes like. Yeah. And it's 
it's kind of a clover. It's really what clover tastes like. And the very large commercial producers, they want honey that looks, tastes um, the same because that's consistent for their customer base. And they also want honey that won't crystallize very quickly. We could talk about crystallization later. But, um, and so to do that, they blend a lot of honeys together. They pasteurize it or heat it to the point where when you heat honey, honey eventually looks and tastes the same. Mm -hmm. It sort of changes the mm. uh, makeup of all those carbohydrates. So we really, we don't blend at all. I mean, we use certain honeys for certain flavors that we have because it works best, but we'll warm it so that it's easier to filter and get out bees, you know, wax and wings and little sticks. Um, and then it makes it a little easier to pour, but that's, you know, we warm it to like 105. Versus. That's uh, more just to make uh, it pourable, if anything. Yeah, but yeah, versus like, like a big yeah. commercial supplier of honey, what, how, how will they, you said you use the word heat with them. So like, what will they uh, do? So what's that, honey? One seventy-five to two twenty-five, or something like that. No, no, no that would be way too. Hard. No, no. I mean, one fifty, one forty is is, is one forty is getting too hot. So anything about that's not good, and it starts hurt impacting the flavor. I see. And so what you're saying is, qualitatively, the more you heat, the less you're stripping flavor in some aspect. The more, you, the more you heat, the more you're stripping flavor. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. so if I'm a consumer and I uh, buy a cloister honey off from a local retailer and then I love that honey, man, I got to get more of that honey. I won't necessarily get that exact honey again. I mean, it could be just as good quality, but it won't be exactly the same. Uh, I would say that might exist. It doesn't exist very often or it doesn't happen very often. If it does, it might with wildflower. Because wildflower is a really generic. So within the range of honey, you have what we call varietals. And a varietal is like a purebred dog, right? Mm -hmm. It's got a name. It's mm -hmm. got sourwood is my favorite. It comes from the sourwood tree in the Appalachian Mountains. Sourwood should always taste like sourwood. Mm -hmm. That is a honey that you know what that tastes like, uh, what that nectar and pollen has produced within that honey. It should never change in flavor. Orange blossom you know, I mean, it could change in a little range. It's very, very small range, but it's going to taste like that. Orange blossom is going to taste like orange blossom. Tupelo is going to taste like Tupelo. Clover tastes like clover. Wildflower is really, you can't pinpoint it to one specific pollen or nectar that is predominant. So it's kind of given this generic name of wildflower. Okay. Wildflower um, is everything else. Yeah. All of our wildflower is really good and it, it's sort of on a range. We try not to definitely, we never produce and we never purchase any wildflower that it isn't absolutely delicious. Okay. But so when I go to buy a, a, a can or a jar of cloister honey, does it tell me the varietal on it then? So do I know if it's clover or it's wildflower? Yeah. yeah. If it's a varietal, if it's a varietal, no. I'll tell you it's sourwood. Okay. It's orange blossom. It's stupid and and with our like what well, we have about twenty flavors, but the va vast majority of them are crystallized honeys or infused honeys. We okay. only have a couple varieties. Yes. So things like our crystallized or whipped cinnamon is our number one flavor. Pumpkin spice is really good. Our ghost pepper whipped honey and Joanne came up mm. with every one of these flavors. She I, developed ooh. them from. I have the ghost pepper scratch. at home, and I use it from time to time you just throw a little bit like on some barbecue so think about or like even bit. chicken wings chicken like wings that. yeah mm. oh man you know it, it does uh throw me back to episode 43 and to put that in perspective <laughs> we're at episode 250 something uh 260 something uh but i'm talking about the episode where we interviewed bob peters at the punch room at the ritz carlton uh, while we were in there, Bob opened the place up. He's no longer there, um, particular, but uh, but he opened the place up uh, on a special day. It was like before they were open, and he made us a bunch of cocktails. Yeah, I think what, that's why he's no longer there. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, he got fired from that episode, episode forty three, last day. You Bob brought them Peters up to the top. Yeah, no, but uh, he did work. He left on his own accord, I believe. Uh, so um, he brought us up there to uh, the roof, where there were many hives. I believe those are your hives. Is that correct? Yeah. It's, that is correct. It's yeah, really it. cool. We've done it ever since they opened until last year. Last year, you know, COVID year, we didn't do it. So it's still to be seen what's going to happen this year. 
That's cool. It's about 20 floors up and it's been, it's a neat experience. They make a lot of honey up there. Well, yeah, because ur- um, so urban farming, yeah, urban hives are a, a real thing, and they exist, I guess. I mean, bees need to live everywhere, and you might as well give them access access points throughout the land. Um, I would imagine, though, I mean, is it, it's got to be a little bit more challenging for an urban bee to, to find its, its, its uh, pollen, right? Or no? Well, that— not Those that. hives were amazing yeah. because they make honey later in the year than any of the other hives that I have, that we have. And I think a lot of it is attributed to so many people live uptown or really close to downtown now. And so many people, they want to keep flowers no matter what. They want their yards to bloom 10 months out of the year if they can. And the bees in Center City have access to so many of them in the, you know, either in the high rises, people have them on their decks yeah. mm-hmm. or there's so much industrial land like railroad tracks you got blackberries and blueberries and just you know wild strawberries growing all the time well plus um, on that now those hives we have to pull down early october because they start cooling off a little bit too much because the thermal um the thermal shedding the wind at 20 stories up is always pushing the heat away yeah but i was going to say that also those bees didn't have to travel far because they're, that was a pretty awesome garden, or that is a pretty awesome garden that yeah. they have on top. So oh, there's a lot right of there, yeah. Yeah, resources for them, I would imagine. Yep. So when you're talking about the different styles of honey, yeah, whipped honey, what does that mean? I mean, you are obviously whipping it, but what, what does that mean? What is that doing for the honey versus just traditional honey? Well, think about it in your own marriage when you know people tell you, you're whipped honey. Oh, my God. <laughs> I had to. You want, you want to do it, Joanne? <laughs> so whipped honey is also honey that some people call it spun, hard, set, uh, whipped, creamed. It all really means the same thing. And really, basically what it means is you force honey to crystallize. Now, honey will crystallize on its own naturally uh, based upon the amount of glucose, the sugar glucose that mm-hmm. happens to be in that honey the amount of glucose that was in the nectar that used to form that honey. So honey has like seven different sugars in it, so carbohydrates, and one of them is glucose. And glucose likes to hang out with glucose. So what ends up happening is a glucose molecule will find another glucose molecule attached to it. And over time, it gets sort of gritty. I love it. It's gritty. It tastes super sweet because when it hits your taste buds, you taste it right away. Um, But it makes the honey harder. And so, okay. so what we did was we um, decided to create some of these honeys with flavors in them because a lot of people don't like the taste of honey, surprisingly. Um, they grew up with, like I said, honey in the bear or commercial honey, and they're just not honey people, but they want to cut back on white sugar, and yeah. this is a way to do it. So we add some seasonings, flavorings to them to make it more palatable. Um, you can't typically put something ground. So honey when it's honey, has less than 18% moisture. If you add a dry ingredient, say ground cinnamon, right? Oh, yeah. To a bucket of honey, it's going to get, it's not going to blend very turn into well. into sludge or so. It's That's right. Yeah. Like if the spoilations would be in there, it'd be super thick, goopy. But if you change the molecular level of the honey by creating these little cells or this little crystal cell, you actually can, the the cinnamon will be suspended within these honey cells. Hmm. And it's just a way of adding uh, another flavor to honey. But you have to kind of do it that way because ground ground cinnamon is completely dry. It has no moisture in it at all. And so when you're tasting whipped honey, it's not like chocolate milk, which everything is emulsified. What you're tasting is you taste the honey and then you taste the cinnamon. Then you taste the honey, then you taste the cinnamon. But it happens so fast, it's all blended together. And it's really evident in the ghost pepper because you get the ghost pepper, you get a little bit of sea salt, you get a little bit of cocoa, and you get the sweetness. And it's just always running through. Mm. So it's she did a good job. We've got the mm. the lavender is amazing. We grind up our own lavender buds, and it's it's amazing. And so yeah, you, every, sorry, go ahead, Joanne. Because it's because honey, we want it to stay as pure as possible. Like we don't use any artificial flavors. We use no oils. It's all like a natural component that we add to the honey, and it's yeah. usually honey plus something. And that's it. And this is your main business right now, in terms of this is how you guys feed your family, pay your mortgage, <laughs> etc. Yes, that that is correct. We are. 
We are all in. Yeah. And it's been going since 07 at this point, since you officially became. She bought me out. So here's our quick rundown. I was a, I was a banker, then I was in the army for four years, then a college, then I went to college, then I came back. I was a banker for about seven years. That's where we met, was at the bank. And um, I started my moving company in 2000, 2000 and ran it till 2019. She bought me the hive in 2007, six. And about six years into it, we were doing okay. And, but Joanne was getting frustrated because she was hiring people to do what she wanted to do, her dream. Mm. And then I'll let her tell you what happened. In yeah, so I guess in 2010, we officially became a business. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, to Randall's point, I mean, we hired a lot of people. A lot of people were doing it. I was still working for the bank. I was making really good money. I was a senior vice president and worked my way up, but I really wasn't fulfilled. Um, and so Randall still had the moving company and I was kind of, um, well, Wachovia, it was 2008. Wachovia was bought by Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. I had just been working a long time, lots of mergers. And I was like, I'm ready to move on. Randall wasn't completely behind me. It was probably a conversation we had uh, for six months by trying to convince him that it was time for me to do what I wanted to do. Well, he was like I preoccupied. Was, He's like, I don't know. I got this beehive thing that you gave me. I don't know what to do. I don't, can't make heads and tails on anything right now. Now you want well, to quit? And he was going to farmer's markets on weekends. Like he was at the wax on market. He was at the market that used to be called the green market, which was uptown. Oh, yeah. By that's that's and a meal. Like, yeah. But he just, you know, we're, we're two completely different people, which is great. It, it, it has its moments of conflict, but it also means we both carry different strengths. And I'm a little bit more of a dreamer. I'm a little bit more of the idealist. Randall's very practical. And, you know, we'd go, he'd pick me up from work. We'd go to lunch at like 300 Main, never get out of the car, argue for 30, 45 minutes. He'd drive me back to work and both of us would miss lunch. And <laughs> I really thought we could make it work. And he really thought we couldn't. <laughs> and on just, just about December 13th, not that I keep that date, but really close to December 13th, um, the night before she would come home, it was a bad day. She was, you know, there's a lot of you know, she was at a smaller bank then, not not at one of the big banks then, and she was still making un, unreal money and doing a great job, but it was not fulfilling and soul sucking, and, and almost misogynistic, yeah. not really respond, not really respected. And so, um, she was she's a tough woman. She's kind of in tears that night, and she's like, "I just don't know what I'm going to do." And I told her, "Whatever you decide, it'll be okay. Don't worry." That was like a Wednesday night. I swear, I swear. Thursday morning, eleven o'clock. She comes walking in the door carrying a box. I'm like, are we going to lunch? She goes, I just quit. <laughs> I just had to, yeah. yeah I mean, I had point. to. You know, when you oh. said soul sucking, that was, that is it. Uh, and you hit it on the head. Mm -hmm. It really was. I mean, I was not fulfilled. I could, you can make a, you can make boatloads of money and not be fulfilled. And Thank he you. didn't give me permission. I wasn't asking for it. I just, <laughs> Wanted to make sure that he would he be knew. okay. And, and we made a deal. I mean, the deal yeah. was six months. If in six months, I knew I could find another job. So I was like, let's try in six months. Give it to me. Let's try this. And at that moment, we were all in and never looked back. You know, entrepreneurship isn't for everyone, but it does need to right. be uh, like you need to have some sort of like runway or – uh, something support of Obviously. like being able yeah. to say, okay, I'm about to break out of this normal yeah. hive mentality. And uh, what a baller, um, uh, you know, think about it, matriarchal kind of way of saying you're like, uh, time to do something different. And this queen bee right here is going to create a business uh, that's all about women, really. It's all about ladies. All about women, baby. Interna International Women's Day was yesterday. Right. So there you go. Uh, it's a very like matriarchal society. Uh, and uh, Randall, you were like, uh, she's like, uh, work, work out the details, and uh, right. we're going to do this. I was scared to death. <laughs> I was scared to death. Oh, we had to take out of the car. We would never be able to pay for the kids to go to college. We were yeah. ruined. He, but I just knew we could do it. Now, to your point, Max, yeah, I mean, 
I worked for the bank a very long time and I worked on the corporate side of the bank and you think you understand business because you look at financial statements or you yeah. run your You're running department. their business. It's their business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is right. That is right. It's theirs. And yeah. you still don't know. It's And for people who are thinking of starting a job, I agree with you. You have to have a runway. You need to do this. We tell we talk to people all the time who want to start a job, and we say to them, "Great, start it while you already have a job." Yeah, because there is a learning curve. You need money. If you say, "I quit and now I'm going to go do this," you got at least a six month to one year runway. You got to you got to fly down before you can actually lift. Doesn't it seem like, I mean, having this conversation, I had this, I was talking to my mom last night and I had the exact conversation about how, you know, they're up in New York still and um, how restaurants are starting to come back and the capacity, you know, restrictions are slowly being lifted and the ones that have made it through are just humming, you know, busy. And I said, and this has been in my mind as other buzzing. people are talking, they, they were buzzing. Yeah. Uh, now, be silver lining of this pandemic seems like prime time to begin a business because it's almost like a fresh start. Plus it seems like landlords are just wishing for people to get into their spaces because so many people vacated spaces over the pandemic. And uh, it just seems like everything is ripe for the taking. If, if you have that entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And some entrepreneurial money. You know, that helps. That. Yeah. Or you go, go to the bank. Yeah. 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 But COVID, way, COVID is, I mean, it's, it's kind of a double edged sword. Listen, right. It's a horrible blessing in disguise. But we were heavy on employees and we were not near as efficient as we should have been. Right. And when COVID came around, it forced us to make some really hard decisions. And then this last year has been our best in ratios. It's, it's our best year. Most and, profitable. Um, we're taking those lessons and moving forward with them. Is you, every, every, Everything has to produce everything. If you're not producing, you got to be gone. You got to cut it. And so it's helped us. And so we're going to be strong. Now. Yeah. It's yeah. like understanding the hive mentality, yeah. like the bee mentality kind of almost, you, you have to take it with you, right? You're like, it works for them and they don't worry about the non, the nonsense and the BS and the superlatives that can make a business like uh, not succeed. You're like, no, it's just, just good product efficiency consistency yeah. and and again rinse wash repeat <laughs> yeah and i think the thing the pandemic also did was you know the um i think like everything including our business as randall said um you know we we the united states we'll just talk about the united states uh we're growing right we have all sorts of industry well the pandemic kind of came through and said what's working and what's not working yeah it kind of forced the closing and I, and I don't mean this in any, you know, um, with any derogatory at all, but it did close some businesses that perhaps were maybe not as successful as they needed to be. It gave people the opportunity to look at it and say, should I be doing something else? Sure. It also gives people the opportunity to say, okay, there's another opening here for me. Right. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, my plan for this coffee bar, this restaurant, this um you know, yarn stuff or whatever it is. I I now have the opportunity to go in and now I get to try it because you know what? There were 15 of them before. We're now down to six and I think I can do it. Yep. So I, I think there's a little bit, you know, I mean, like you had to be strong to survive. Yeah. It's like a natural selection almost kind of thing. In some ways. Yeah. I was listening to uh, Robin Pecknell, the lead singer of Fleet Foxes. This actually does connect. He said he was like talking about the pandemic uh, exposed a lot of dilettantes in the in the industry, people that are and I didn't know what the word dilettante meant, so mm-hmm. I had to look it up. And I'm like, oh, uh, a, a crafter, an artisan that kind of recreationally does the thing that they do. But he's like, it really did separate the pros from the amateurs because the only way you were going to continue to make music in this industry without touring, without whatever, is if this is all you do mm-hmm. and like this is it. And and also like Cream Rises in this restaurant industry kind of say, if you're going to do it, man, you've got to be all in, a hundred percent, and you got to know what you're doing. There's no more like, oh, I'll, I'll go in it with a buddy, and we're like, well, you can't mess up pizza. It's like, well. <laughs> yeah, but you can mess up like or all the business. Or there's other restaurant pizza places that do it better than you do. So yeah, 
But I, I do believe in it. And, you know, maybe that is a day of reckoning. Maybe there's like a little renaissance to all of that. But I think those that have stuck with it and those that are opening up new businesses now are going to redefine what was kind of a pretty messed up industry, just economically, both food, beverage, everything related to the uh, the, the food market, if you will. You know, it's good cool. to know that, that you guys have been able to kind of push through. I know uh, there was an article earlier that you're still in collaborations with Birdsong. You guys do uh, some fantastic beer collaborations with them. They're a previous guest of our show, Fantastic Brewery. I love knowing the the, the blending, the merging of all that. Anything on the uh, the horizon? Like anything that you guys are looking forward to doing in the new year? Any new flavors? Any new um, collaborations that are, are coming your way? Uh, from We definitely have new flavors this year. So one of the things that we that I do with every new flavor is before it's launched, it actually gets tested by the North Carolina, uh, North Carolina State University's entrepreneurial program. Oh, yeah. And this is for any of your listeners that are thinking of um, coming up with a food product. I would definitely suggest that they use those, that they use them. They're a great team. Yeah. They will study your product. They will tell you uh, it's shelf stabil- how shelf stable it is. Uh, give you feedback about if there's too much water content, if you need to put in any kind of preservative. They also do your um, nutritional labeling. So they're great. So we will go to them. We've, you know, we kind of two years ago, we had a couple of things in the works and then last year just didn't even launch. But yeah, we've got a couple of flavors coming out this year. Well, one suggestion I will make uh, is that maybe, for example, you talk to one of your local distillers like Defiant in Charlotte or whoever is making some good booze out there. Infuse that with honey, and then you can infuse proof alcohol ice cream with that liquor. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and proof alcohol ice cream is a great sponsor and friend of our show, and they're not far from you. They're out of South Carolina. Uh, they have some great new flavors. They have a 7% alcohol ice cream. So uh, it's the creamiest ice cream you could imagine, and then has all these beautiful flavors like they've got the uh, they just re released the bourbon chocolate cherry. They did that oh, kind of yeah. like for a Valentine's Day, but uh, but they're always looking to do some new flavors, new collaborations. Really fun company. I wonder. I mean, obviously, honey would go really well in in ice cream, but I wonder if like just complete substitute sugar out for honey uh, to just make Ooh. your ice cream that way. I bet that would be kind of interesting. You probably have to figure it out a little bit but um but yeah check out proof alcohol ice cream you can go to proofalcoholicecream.com or the 200 plus retail locations across the carolinas and florida it is made daily in columbia south carolina and uh, look for their little red pints and the coolers at uh, lowe's total wine harris teeter or more specifically the triangle wine company who also carries them guys oh i do have uh, one quick bee joke I have one good B joke before we get out of here. Okay. Three bees fly into a pub and land on the bar. Barkeep says, Well, bees, uh, what can I get for you? The bees order a half a drop of mead, and the barkeep finds an eyedropper and dispenses their order. Full of curiosity, the barkeep asks, So, uh, do bees drink a lot? And one of the bees replies, No, just enough to get a buzz on. Wow. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Tip your waiters and your waitresses, people. Oh, my God. That's right. Uh, All right. No, but you guys, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Cloister honey can be found in many places. Uh, wh- where where might we find them in general? Uh, on our website, you can go pull uh, the, the retailers up. But we have people all over North and South Carolina. Yeah, you're like in 40 states, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, but we're, we, yeah, we're more than We've that. been doing the big shows like Atlanta and Vegas and New York for a couple of years. And so we have really good coverage and we've done self-distribution and it's continuing. That's what's kept us alive. It's remarkable. And you guys should be proud of what you've done. Yeah, you're near national distribution at this point. More power to you. Hey, Randall and Joanne, thank you guys so much for being on really fascinating to say the least uh, to talk with you guys and learn about the life inside the hive so for all of you out there get yourself some cloister honey and you will eat very merrily thanks for listening to the nc fnb podcast and if you've stuck with us this long review us on itunes and remember five stars are encouraged